All right, everybody, we're uh, back with Steve talking about the eShop on web, ASP.NET Core application. Take it away, sir. Hey, everybody. I know we're running behind. Sorry about that. I'm looking forward to uh, getting started quickly and hopefully getting us a little bit back on schedule. I can't guarantee I'll be done in 19 minutes, but uh, we'll be quick. So let me start by sharing my screen here. Um, figure that out. Here we go. Share screen. You should be seeing a, a slide. Let's see. We're all good. Yeah. All right. Looks good. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about clean architecture because uh, it applies quite a bit to the eShop on web sample. Uh, if anyone has any questions for me and we don't get to it today, all my information is right here on this slide. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter as Ardallis. Uh, I'm also on Twitch as Ardallis as well. If you want to follow me there, I usually stream on Fridays. You're welcome to follow up with any questions you have there. Uh, we're going to do this talk in under 30 minutes, hopefully under 18 minutes now. So if you want to grab the uh, the reference app, you can go here, aka.ms web app architecture, or you just do a Google search for eShop on web. Uh, it looks like this when you run it. There's a uh, free ebook. It's about 140 pages, if I remember right, PDF that you can download, or it's available on the awesome doc site uh, that Myra and uh, her team work on. Uh, so you can find it online as well if you don't want to grab the PDF. Uh, also, I just wanted to mention that uh, this week we just launched a preview edition of a uh, architecting cloud native .NET apps for Azure book, which you can find at, at this URL, which someone will probably be nice enough to throw in the chat for me. Okay, so I have a whole slide deck that takes about an hour at a conference to talk about clean architecture and principles and things like that. I'm going to skip to the end and talk about just some of the most important parts, which have to do with dependencies. And so if we think about how dependencies work in a typical old school N-tier application, you've got something like this, where your direct dependencies, because you're newing up something or you have a static call you're making, look like this on the left where you have a class that references another class by newing it up or making a static call on it, and it references another class, right? And so then at runtime, it runs the same way that it compiles. If you use the dependency inversion principle, which like I said, I normally cover in this talk, uh, it looks more like this. So at compile time, you reference an abstraction, an interface. And so at class A, looking here at the left, references interface B, and class B might implement it. Uh, meanwhile, class B also needs to use some functionality. It references an interface as well, which might be implemented by class C. Now at runtime, your control flow runs through those classes just like it did before, but now because we have those interfaces, we have seams that we can use to break apart how the application is constructed. I can compose it modularly at runtime from different implementations, and I can also use those seams to make the code a lot more uh, easy to test. Okay, so one of the goals of clean architecture and for the eShop on web reference architecture is we want to make the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard. We want to force developers to kind of fall into doing the right thing without thinking about it. And one of the ways that we do that is we construct the solution in such a way that the dependencies flow the way they're supposed to. And if you try and go the wrong way, Visual Studio or the .NET Core build system will stop you because the references just don't work that way. All right, so one of the things that is a principle that we want to follow is that our UI classes shouldn't depend directly on the infrastructure classes. That's going to make them more tightly coupled. It's going to make them harder to test. It's going to make it harder to swap in different implementations of infrastructure. For example, we just heard about Cosmos DB. If instead of Cosmos, we wanted to swap that out for a different data store of some sort, then we would have a hard time doing that if directly inside our web project we were working with Cosmos DB APIs. Um, another example of this is that we want our business and domain classes not to depend on those infrastructure classes for the same reason. Um, let me just check the uh, chat here for a sec and make sure everything's okay. Do, do, do. Yeah, all right, looks like we're good, okay. Um, the other thing is if we have a lot of repetition in our code, if we have the same like DB context calls in every controller over and over and over again, that kind of repetition makes it harder to change directions, to swap in a different implementation uh, and, and violates the don't repeat yourself principle. So are there patterns that we can use to make it so that it's a little bit easier uh, for us to use these these things in a, in a repetitive, uh, less repetitive way, you know, to reuse them more often? Things like query logic, validation logic, et cetera. Okay, now I, I loosely talked about these dependencies, but here's an example of the issue you get if you don't follow clean architecture's pattern. 
you end up with a data layer that talks to a database, typically. You have a business layer that calls the data layer and a UI layer that calls the business layer. This is your traditional end tier. And these transitive dependencies mean that everything depends on the database, which makes it really hard to test, uh, at least in, in a performant way. Um, so everything depends on the database. The clean architecture, which goes by other names like uh, onion architecture or hexagonal architecture or ports and adapters, this is probably my favorite diagram that kind of shows how it all comes together. So in the middle, you've got your business rules. That's your domain layer. You might also have a small application layer that sits around that that has some rules for how your application specifically works. It's going to expose these ports that other things can implement that are outside of that core application layer domain layer. What is a port? Well, in .NET, a port is something that you can implement. So generally, it's going to be an interface. So if we look at that top right purple icon, the internal persistence port, that might be a repository or some other interface that you would use uh, for storing data and retrieving data from wherever. And so in your infrastructure layer, you might have a SQL Server or, or other database implementation. You might have an in-memory one that you use maybe for just for testing or for demos. And you can swap those in and out easily because they both implement that same port. And you can see there's other ports used in this example as well. Okay, so before we jump into the eShop on web, let's talk briefly about the different projects involved. In eShop on web, there is an application core project, and the things that go in there are these types of things. Um, we're going to see interfaces. Uh, most of those are going to be in core. We're going to have entities, aggregates, value objects. These are domain-driven design uh, patterns uh, that their implementations typically live in the core project. Any domain services, which are you know services that are purely business logic, should be in core as well. If you're going to use custom exceptions, this is where they would be defined so that they're accessible from anywhere in your app. Uh, if you're using domain events and event handlers, which is a great pattern for you to investigate, they would also be inside of the core project. And then specifications, which we're going to look at if we have time today, uh, are another thing that would live inside of that core project. OK, so now what goes in the infrastructure project? Remember, the core project does not depend on infrastructure. The infrastructure project depends on core. OK, so inside of infrastructure, you're going to have repositories if you're using that pattern. Repositories are just implementations of an interface for persistence. And so if you're using Entity Framework, Entity Framework Core in this case, that's going to live inside of infrastructure as well, along with repositories that might use it. Uh, if you're using caching, which I strongly recommend that you do, your cached repositories would also live inside infrastructure, and they would have a dependency on whatever cache provider you're using. This might be Redis, this could just be in memory, et cetera. Um, I see real, there's some questions on the chat about whether or not we're going to do Blazor, when we're going to update the 3.0. Those things are all on the roadmap and should be happening soon. Um, I don't have a deadline yet, but I would hope to have them done before uh, 3.1 of .NET Core comes out. Um, if you're consuming external APIs, then you've got uh, Web API clients would be here. Anything accessing the file system, if you're using custom logging adapter implementations, those would go in here. Uh, anything doing email, things that reference internal uh, infrastructure like your system clock even. A lot of us don't think about that, but that's infrastructure as well because it's outside of your program running inside your memory space. Uh, another one is configuration files would often be something that you might put the accessors for or the logic for in the infrastructure project. In .NET Core, we typically can just use the built-in configuration stuff, so that isn't one that's in this particular example. But if you're using traditional you know, full framework .NET, you might want to put your configuration uh, code inside of infrastructure. And you might have other services here as well. And occasionally interfaces. The only interfaces that should be here are ones that are tightly coupled to some kind of infrastructure. So if you are using, uh, let's say, a, an Azure SDK and it has a, a custom interface that returns back Azure-specific types, uh, that interface should live in infrastructure because it depends on that SDK. And so it shouldn't go inside of your core project. All right, so then what goes in the web project? The web project is your UI front end for this application. It should have mostly things that have to do with web stuff and not things that relate to business logic and not stuff that relates to other kinds of infrastructure. So you're going to have controllers. You're going to have views. Um, you might have razor pages, depending on which technology you're using. We actually have all three of these inside the reference app eShop on web just to show you how they all work and that you can use them all together if you want. Um, your view models, your API models, your binding models, these DTO types generally are going to live inside of the web project as well, um, with some exceptions. Occasionally, you might pull them up into the core project if it makes it easier for you to use them from other services. Uh, any kind of MVC filters, model binders, tag helpers, all that stuff is very web-specific. It should go in the web project. 
Uh, and then you might have other services or interfaces um, that just don't belong anywhere else. Um, so application services, they might live in the web project because that's the front end of your application. And that's the example that we use in eShop on web, mostly for simplicity purposes. Uh, likewise, interfaces that go with those application services might live there as well. Uh, another question about uh, .NET Core 3 on the, con on the chat. Yeah, expect that to come. It's just not there yet. All right, then um, there's another thing that you might have. This isn't actually in eShop on web, but if you had multiple different solutions in your organization, which many of us do, and you want to share code between them, uh, there's a concept in domain-driven design called shared kernel. And you can use shared kernel to share things between those projects. My recommendation is to use NuGet packages for this, and you can put any kind of shared types in there. So base, base classes, common exceptions, common authentication user classes, guard clauses, all those kinds of things might go there. All right, so when you're done, here's pretty much what the structure looks like. All right, you've got your web project depends on core. Your infrastructure depends on core. You have different tests that each focus on these different projects. Now, you might have unit tests for all of these things, but most of your unit tests are going to be against core, and most of your functional tests are going to be hitting web, and most of your integration tests are going to hit infrastructure. It's typically how it plays out. Now, web has a, a light gray uh, arrow pointing to infrastructure because the dependency on infrastructure should be minimal. The only place in your web project that should know about infrastructure, if any, is going to be in that startup CS that wires it all together. All right, here's the folder structure. We'll look at that in a sec. Let's go to the code. Um, all right, so here's eShop on web. Let's uh, stop this for just a moment. And we see the, the project uh, has this application core and I pretty much already ran through all the stuff that's in here. Um, infrastructure has the the data, and then there's the uh, the test, the web project. Um, let's start by looking at the home page. The home page actually uses Razor Pages, so this is the uh, Pages folder. There's an index.cshtml. That's the, the main page for the site, and then this index page uh, that has the on get. If you haven't used Razor Pages before, that's what's going to handle this this page all right so this is essentially the same as having a home controller with uh, an index dot um, action method that gets loaded so if we run this um, and just do a quick look at the application itself so you can see what's there and let's see thought i already had it up somewhere let's go there all right so that's the thing on GitHub. Here's the actual page open on my other screen. So this is the app running. Um, the home page supports paging. Uh, it supports filtering. So if you just want to see mugs, you can do that. If you just want to see different brands like .NET, you can see that. Uh, you can log in. There's a built-in uh, user here, this demo user at Microsoft, this pass at word one, log in. Now I'm logged in. Uh, I can add items to my shopping cart. I can update their quantities and check out and then i can go up here i can view my orders i can see here's my order i just placed right now i've got five minutes left uh, i can click on details i can see everything about what i bought that's pretty much it there's no payment providers it's just a demo app um, but it but it sufficiently shows that level of complexity inside the application all right so now let's show how this works as we come into the application so on this first page let me turn this off for a second so you can read it easier. Um, the first thing we're going to use is this catalog view model service. This is an application service. And the reason why it lives inside of the web application is because it returns a view model. So this catalog model is the view model it's going to return. Um, since view model is a web-specific thing, it didn't necessarily make sense to put the, the service inside of a different project than web. Okay, so if we turn this back on as a breakpoint and just walk through what it's doing, we'll be able to see kind of how we go through these different layers and how they're related to one another. Um, so start up, there we go. And we should hit our breakpoint, here we go. And we're gonna step into this. And now we're in the cache catalog view model service. All right, so we're using caching. And the first thing that's gonna happen here is, uh, when we get to the key map, we're going to create a cache key based on the different things that we need to know about this request. In this case, it's page index, items per page, brand ID, et cetera. Um, if we find it in the cache, then we're just going to return it right away. Uh, in this case, I just launched this thing, so it's not going to be in the cache. So we're going to step in uh, to this one, and it's going to take us into the catalog view model service here that's actually going to get the catalog item. So this is like the real one, not the cached one. All right. So stepping into 
that, now we are inside the get catalog items actual method uh, that knows how to go and get catalog items. So let's look at what this is doing. We can see it's got a little bit of logging uh, and then <clears throat> it has a couple specifications. Now I mentioned that we would talk about the specification pattern here in a moment. Uh, this is what it's doing. The specification is a pattern where you define a query as an object. Right? And so in this case, instead of having a Lambda expression right here, or worse, inside my controller or inside my Razor page, I've defined the query that I want to make and put it into its own object, which is this catalog filter specification. So if we jump into that one, we can see here is where that Lambda lives. Right? So this is using a base specification type, um, and it's just passing in the Lambda to say that you know the brand um, ID and the catalog uh, brand ID have whatever value, right? So that's the where clause that it's going to generate. Um, from there, we're also going to get uh, the paginated specification here. So it's just another specification that knows how to do the work to get the paging. Uh, and then we're going to do um, a, a check to get the list and then another check to get the count uh, because we need the count so we can display the total number of items. Uh, and then we just loop through the page, grab the pictures that are associated with them. So there's a bunch of those, so we'll skip past that. Um, and we'll F5. And then we build the view model, right? So that's the main responsibility of this service is go fetch the data and then go build the view model and then return it. All right. Um, so looking at all this, we return that view model. Uh, everything comes back out, it stores it in the cache, and we're done, and the page displays. All right. If we hit it again the second time, and if we're fast enough and we drill in here, what's going to happen is we're going to hit this. And it's going to say, oh, it was in the cache, and it's going to pop right out. And the result's going to take like almost no time. And I must have hit something to edit something. So we'll stop that. All right, so let's talk for a little bit about the specification pattern, because I think it's one of the more interesting pieces here that most people haven't used. Um, I mentioned, let's see, let's look at the customer orders with item specification. So here's an example of a specification. One of the challenges that you have when you use an ORM and a repository, and the reason why a lot of people don't necessarily like using the repository pattern, uh, is because you can't always easily uh, describe the query adequately, right? Sometimes the repository implementation hides how you're going to get the, the data. And so what specification allows you to do is, is avoid that by saying, no, I can actually be very specific about the actual query I want to run. In this case, it's very simple. Get me the items for this buyer, um, as well as the shape of the data I want to return, right? So in this case, if I need to include some related tables and not use lazy loading, because that's evil in a web app, um, I can go ahead and I can add these include items here. If I want to add filtering or paging, or not filtering, if I want to add paging, I can do it here with one line. I can just say apply paging. Um, so what does my repository look like? Because a lot of times what happens when you have a repository is you end up adding a bunch of extra query methods, right? So you've got like an order repository and it has a list method, and then you have another one that says get the order items with paging, get the order items with filtering and paging, and you end up with 10 additional you know, query repository methods, all for different custom queries you might want to run. This is my generic repository for the whole application. Um, it doesn't have any of those special types of uh, extra methods on it, right? It just has your, your typical CRUD methods um, on here. The only one that's probably one that's not typically in most repos that I see people use is this count one. Um, but this list all async with a specification, that's very, very flexible. That's what's used by just about any uh, query in the system that needs to, to pull back data. Um, and so this uses this apply specification helper method, which is just down here, and it uses a specification evaluator to construct a query inside the repository using all the features of the specification. And what are those? Well, they include adding the criteria. So we just say dot where, and we add the criteria off the specification. That's that lambda that we saw. And then we can do includes. So here's how you add all the includes from the specification onto your query. Um, likewise, you can do ordering and grouping, and then paging as well if that's enabled. So this one place evaluates everything on the specification, turns that into an appropriate query on the DB context, uses iQueryable to do it, right? Everything in here is using iQueryable, but the repository itself doesn't expose iQueryable. Right? If we look at these return types, specifically for list, I'm returning a read-only list of T here. I've already hit the database, I've already gotten all the data, and I've already turned it into an in-memory list when I come back from my repository. And I do that everywhere. 
That's, again, helping developers fall into the pit of success because they're never going to accidentally not know whether or not something coming back from the, that repository is going to execute on the database or it's going to execute in memory inside their application. If it came back from the repository, it's in memory. If it's huge and you just pulled back a million records from your customer's table, then you just did that, right? You know that that's what you just did. Um, and if you need to filter it, you know that you can filter it in a specification. The last reason why you should consider using specifications if you haven't used them before uh, is that you get this catalog here of different types of queries that are very reusable and that have a specific name. So every developer can go and look in the list of specifications. And if this gets big, you know, you just break it out into folders based on whatever it is you're, you're trying to query. But this becomes a, an alternative to having store procedures that would have all these different types of custom queries um, inside of your application. Now you can, you can name them, you can version control them, you can stick them all in this one place, and you can write tests against them. Right? It's very easy for me to write tests that verify that these queries do what they're supposed to do. Um, let's see, uh, that's most of what I wanted to cover. The uh, other bit here is inside of the entities section, you'll notice these are broken up into aggregates. Aggregates are another domain-driven design pattern I mentioned briefly, where you fetch and, and store things as a unit. So when we grab the basket and its items, we do that as a single operation. You won't see um, us going and, and fetching out a basket item or a list of basket items uh, directly without grabbing the whole basket. Uh, same thing with an order. Right? When we fetch an order um, in this pattern, we fetch the whole order with all of its items. And that's why we, we have specifications for things that say, hey, go get me the thing with all of its children. So that when we make that call using Entity Framework, uh, everything comes back at once like that. Um, the other thing that we have support for is Docker. So if we come in here and we say Docker Compose up, uh, this will go ahead and create the application in Docker for us. It's running on uh, port 5106, I believe. So if I come up here and hit localhost 510, um, you'll see the application is running here in Docker. Um, if I you know, hit refresh or click on different things here, you can see that all this is logging out from, from the Docker container. Uh, so if you haven't used Docker before, you can grab this application. It's, a, it's got all the files you need to kind of get started. Uh, it's pretty, pretty simple, pretty easy to get going. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to show, and I've, I'm almost hitting my time. So uh, let me come back here, verify I don't have anything else. No, not doing that. Um, here's some uh, resources. Yeah, well, that'll be good to end with. Um, all right, so I can check questions real quick, and then I know they're going to want to move on to the next person and hopefully recover some time here. Um, so yeah, let's see. Eric Eflem's talking about my course on Pluralsight with Julie Lerman. That's this uh, DDD Fundamentals course. You can check that out if you want. Um, and let me see what other questions there might be before Javier, Javier goes, goes and puts, puts me, me back, back on, on video, video, which, which is, is fine. fine. Yeah, wow, in back. 20 minutes. <laughs> Anybody questions? There was a question earlier about if the demo uses CQRS. Does the demo use CQRS? No, it does not, um, but that's a good question. Let me uh, let me talk real quick about the companion application for this. So um, there's also eShop on containers. All right, so if you want to see advanced patterns, do a quick search for eShop on containers. There's another book that goes with this. Um, this is a, a more advanced application. The book is here, done at Microservices by uh, Cesar and, and a couple others. Um, and it's, it's a great place for you to learn more about microservices, Docker containers, um, Helm charts, Kubernetes, Azure Kubernetes service, all that stuff. Uh, if you look at it, it actually is the same application, but broken up into microservices. So it's the same eShop, it's got a shopping cart, it's got login, it's got a catalog, but every one of those things is its own separate microservice doing the work. All right, there was another question. Do you have any complex business logic in view models? No, there should be no business logic in view models, and certainly no complex business logic. All right, any other questions? And yeah, and there was someone asking about learning about DDD, where they share your your course on that, and any use of actors. No, it's not using actors currently. Um, there's a few things that I want to add in the short term. One of them is more support for Mediator, uh, which I want to show examples of. Another one is um, obviously we, we want to do more with um, Blazor. 
Uh, I've been wanting to add SignalR for a little while, and that would be easy to do alongside Blazor. Um, so those are some of the, the, the easy three things I'd like to add, along with updating, of course, to .NET Core 3.0. All right, awesome. Um, so thank you so much, Steve, for the great talk. People were excited uh, to join, and I think the feedback shows that they're, they're, it was really good. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all of this. Yeah, is there a repo where slides will be available for .NET Conf? I see some people asking, and I'm happy to, to send them yeah, as long as I know where to send them. Here, while we were on the break, and uh, there seems to be a repo, so we can share that later. Um, so. But Great. if not, you can share it on Twitter, uh, on your Twitter account, and then people can grab it from there as well. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. So, folks, uh, look for me on twitter.com slash rdallas. I don't know if I'm still sharing my screen, but yes. that's me. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, hit me up there or find me on Twitch as rdallas. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you.